It was such an honor to interview George Merrill and Shannon Rubicam of Boy Meets Girl. Not only did they write and perform Waiting for a Star to Fall, but they also sang backing vocals and some songs that you know and love and might be surprised to hear about. Plus, they wrote for the incredible Whitney Houston, I Want to Dance with Somebody, and How Will I Know. They also were able to put out an album in 2021. I'm going to talk all about that and more with wonderful George and Shannon. Here we go. Wow. George Merrill, Shannon Rubicam right in front of me. Boy meets girl. I can't believe it. I have been chasing you guys for years and finally I got you. Welcome, welcome. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Hi, Meredith. So that was you. Now we know. <laughs> I was, I was chasing after you. I really was. Um, I've been a huge fan. I know a lot of people are huge fans of yours. I'm excited to tell people that, in my opinion, the two of you have made such an incredible stamp, everlasting stamp on the music industry um, with not only just how you are as performers, but your songwriting abilities, of course, writing two of the biggest songs of all time. Another song that is my my phone uh, uh, <laughs> alarm every morning. I wake up to it every morning. <laughs> I love that. That's so yeah. cool. Thank you. George and Shannon, how are you guys? Well, oh. we're good and, and even better after that introduction. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm feeling all chuffed now. That's nice. Thank you so much. Of yeah. course, of course. Well, you know, let's go back in time a little bit because um, of course, you wrote for Whitney Houston. You wrote for Dolly and Smokey. You were, I, I couldn't believe, uh, you know, doing my show, I do all the research. And so I play Waiting for a Star to Fall on the Yacht Club. Um, I play Whitney Houston songs on the Yacht Club, right? Mm -hmm. And then I was researching Denise Williams, let's hear it for the boy. And I go, hold on a second, mind is blown. It's George <laughs> and Shannon, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So. I'm curious, like through this interview, if I can pick at you a little bit and see if maybe there are some things that I don't know about you that I can't find anywhere because I've searched. Um, so let's start out, of course, <laughs> with Boy Meets Girl. You guys, you guys were married. Now you're not. Um, I've been there, done that, understand. Um, kudos that you guys can still work together, which is awesome. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about forming Boy Meets Girl. And I know that the song originally wasn't gonna be recorded by the two of you, but I'm glad that two people passed it up and you two took it over because <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> well, let's see, the forming of Boy Meets Girl, we were in a trio. I joined George and a friend of his in their duo at the time, way, way, way back in time. And um, yeah, so I formed the third part harmony for them. So we were in a, a trio called Sparrow for a time. And then that group broke up and George and I continued to, we had just discovered we could write together. <laughs> so. Yeah. Shannon had, plop, she had, uh, she had plopped a big page of lyrics down in front of me. Um, at the title was Good Exchange. And I, I, you know, I've never, let's just get this out of the way right now, Shannon. I mean, were you I, like, uh -oh. let's, let's, let's try for a good exchange was the course, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, was that, was that the idea right at the very top? Like, like, you know, like that maybe oh, we was would it write premeditated? together? Yeah. No, it, it wasn't really. You were, we were playing in Corona Del Mar at a club. Yeah. Yeah. In California. And, um, we we were in a little rental house there we had no furniture except you know i think we had sleeping bags on the floors and um a piano of course piano. Yeah, <laughs> piano. <laughs> so, <laughs> so i was in another part of the house and i heard george playing the piano so and i had just written out this kind of stream of consciousness lyric from the day before and it was kind of about the experience of being in southern california for the first time it was new to me as a seattle person uh, so i was getting used to sort of the culture of southern california okay and wrote that lyric good exchange so i go in there i put the lyrics down in front of george and and i just start singing because this melody comes out and it's 
goes perfectly with George's chords and and with the music. And so I, um, that's the first song we wrote together. And I don't know why we didn't think about writing together before that, because we'd written separately. But so that, so we started Boy Meets Girl shortly after that. Oh, but, magical. Meredith, that's an exclusive, because I was trying to figure out, <laughs> uh, I've, I've always kind of thought, I mean, I, I've, I've always had that in mind. Like, good exchange how prophetic you know that that mm -hmm. that, that that was the the first uh, co-write that we that we had in the very beginning so i thought it was i was good to hear the story shannon it's like i i didn't i didn't really know it's yeah great. <laughs> I, I always say that interviewing songwriters that's where the stories are i mean artists okay. have stories they've got you know tour stories and fun stories too but but songwriters really, that's where you're gonna get the fun stories, the great stories. You know, let's talk about <laughs> waiting for a star to fall. How did you guys write that? Mm -hmm. that, well. was, that was another sort of um, vortex of <laughs> serendipity was. and magic. Um, we were, we'd written How Will I Know, Whitney Houston recorded it uh, much to our, you know, boggling our minds really. And, um, we were at her first ever concert tour. She swung through Los Angeles, of course, and we were at the Greek theater, which is an open air theater in Los Angeles. And it was a clear night. She just finished singing um, How Will I Know? And, and the audience just had leapt to their feet and enthusiastically applauded. But I, but I was sitting in my seat and looked up and saw this star going across that circle of the sky <laughs> made by the amphitheater. So I didn't jump to my feet. I got out my notebook and wrote down waiting for a star to fall. Just yeah. that line. And thought, yeah. I'll get back to that. And, yeah. I that. and then you, you guys came together, wrote this song, offered it to, wasn't it to Belinda Carlisle and Whitney? It was, it was somehow it got into Belinda Carlisle's hands. It also got into Robert Palmer's hands. Um, oh, that, that would have been so wrong. I, I, well, you know, but, but we were songwriters for hire as well. We were staff yeah. writers and as well as being artists as Boy Meets Girl. We tried to keep certain songs for ourselves. We were being produced by um, Arif Martin, the great Arif Martin. Uh, and as he was listening to the songs that we had that, you know, available for him to produce, um, he keed on waiting for a start of, a start of fall. He said, I would like to work on this p particular song. And so, yeah. so we, you know, so we found out that, that Robert Palmer was, was really interested in the song and mm. he said, I will take care of this. And so he, <laughs> I, we, we still don't know exactly what, what a reef said to Robert Palmer, but, um, or his manager. Yeah, right. But he, he, he finagled it back to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so it became our song for 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 that moment. And and um, you know, it was a wonderful experience having a reef produce because at that at that point I was developing myself as a as a producer as well, arranger, yeah. had all along, but, uh, and 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 and. Uh, Shannon and I, I, I really, I, I think I got credit, but Shannon and I produced this, the uh, one half of the real life album. Um, it was uh, more George. Well, okay. okay. Well, <laughs> um, you know, but it's like a reef just brought this other level of knowledge and wisdom. And, you know, I mean, the guy that, that, you know, did the string arrangements and production for Aretha Franklin and things like that. I mean, mm -hmm. just this brilliant mind and talent um you know he heard the song and from from the from the demo stage to you know sitting down at the piano in the studio and he's he and i are sitting there and he's going you know it shouldn't have just a normal key change why don't we use that da 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 da, da you know the, the the phrase that starts the choruses why don't we go da 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 so just with that little thing that I, I just, mm -hmm. I just hadn't, I hadn't imagined that, you know? So he, he just had the musical depth to, why don't we do the key change right in that phrase that we've already established through the song. Right. And all of a sudden that, that, that moment happens. And then um, Andy Snitzer, the sax player. 
Uh, I was gonna bring up the sax player. <laughs> and then he comes in, and he and he just and the, and the note that comes out of him when we're in the oh studio, you know, he That's so he blaring. yeah, so he follows that key change. And just imagine the song, okay. It doesn't have any saxophone in it yet, right? So we come up with this whole idea and, and all the music's going along and it's and it's powerful and all that. But then he comes into the studio and then the first note out of him is that, you know, it's just he took it to a whole other level. I mean, the saxophone, I mean, I to me, that that's one of the, the major features of the song. It's one of the greatest sax solos ever, might I yeah. just say. Oh, totally great. Yeah. It really yeah. is phenomenal. Well, yeah. he, he had just come from playing um, a bar mitzvah. Yeah. <laughs> he came from a bar mitzvah. He was dressed in a tux, studio. wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. another gig, you know? <laughs> well, and sax, sax players are, are you know, they're, they're known for dressing in black leather and wearing, having their gig bag and, yeah. you know, they have a whole, and maybe a, a leather hat, just this sort of a, you know, I'm, a, I'm cool. But I mean, he comes in all dressed, you know, with a fluffy tuck shirt and everything. Like like, he goes, sorry, I just came from playing a bar mitzvah. So, and then he blows that beautiful sax um, solo that really was a collaboration between he and Arif for the most part. Yeah. Um, Arif being, he was such a fabulous arranger. He just heard all these arrangements in his head. So he and Andy more or less worked out that sax solo and it, it's so iconic now, it's beautiful. From the yeah. horror to waiting for a star to fall, <laughs> he made it happen. It was like a, it was like a mitzvah in itself. Yeah. <laughs> I so. That's true. Oh my gosh, that's fabulous. I mean, really, I, I, I was gonna bring him up because it really is such an iconic sax solo in that, and it just makes you know the song even that much bigger than it already is, you know, in itself. Yeah, it was it just, one of those moments when we got to the point where where we were mixing the song and we started yeah. hearing, you know, uh, David Leonard, the fabulous mixer uh, on that song, um, as as he was getting all the pieces together and it was coming together um, out of the speakers, it was starting to pump and. Um, yeah, that was an amazing, that was yet another one of those amazing moments because, you know, you, you've had enough experience in the studio, you know, mm -hmm. you've had, you've had songs sound a certain way, but everything was coming together for this. And, mm -hmm. and so those early moments with David Leonard in the, in the mix room, when all the parts were coming together and he, he was, he was balancing them all that, that was still one of, one of my favorite moments. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me say I was babysitting back in the day and I couldn't I couldn't afford the full album. So back then you get the cassette single, right? Right. <laughs> cassette yeah, single, and I got I went to Sam Goody. I remember it. Bought oh. the cassette single of Waiting for a Star to Fall. Flip <laughs> it over, put it in, and side B, no apologies. Oh, blew me away. Yeah. Love no apologies. Yeah. I can't even believe that, that 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 song didn't even get more airplay that song to me like should have been the second big hit from that mm. album i love I no totally album. you know oh. that is so sweet that you would say that meredith because that the, I, and again brilliant quirky sax solo by larry williams on that song it, the, the, it, it's like he i remember when he came up with that it was just it was like how does how does this fit in here and how does it fit emotionally in the song because it's like a it's an intense song it is um, you know but but the way he kind of flitted about and had those little bursts it's it, it worked emotionally for the song to me mm -hmm. yeah it was it was really powerful i love that you keyed on that yeah um, no yeah. i mean it's one of my all-time favorite songs is no apologies I don't know why we didn't end up with um, a couple of more singles off that real life album, but um, it's, I, as I'm I thinking think back, it's probably because, um, you know, something more mundane like uh, record companies uh, are allotting a certain amount of promo money per group and, um, and they have to figure out who's going to get it now and who's got the most momentum and where the dollars are going to go. And I think it probably came down to something more like that. There was some more pressing need for, you know, another band to be promoted or something. 
I, I think it could be that. It also, it, it, it also, uh, you know, I, I think of Fleetwood Mac. A Fleet, Fleetwood Mac had um, three lead singers. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and, and they had three singles. They, they all had singles as well. Mm-hmm. And, yep. and our record company and us, we weren't really, we weren't probably weren't in sync enough to, for, to, to put together. We have two lead singers here. Shannon's not a backing singer. Right. And and I mean, Stormy Love, I mean, there were there were you had a number of songs on there that could if we had really made the effort and promoted you as a lead singer, because you were you were killing it. You were you were doing some beautiful vocal work. Well, or maybe just understood better what the um, difficulty might have been for the or the challenge might have been for the record company. I think we didn't quite have our heads around all that. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Did you yeah. guys. Did you have a different feeling when waiting for a star to fall went to number one as opposed to how will I know or I want to dance with somebody who <laughs> number one? Oh, What's yeah. The, I want to know kind of the feeling of, of. Um, you know, as being artists was really our longtime dream. It was our primary focus. Mm-hmm. And it just happened that the songwriting aspect of our work took off before our artistry did, our recording artistry. So yeah, there was a much more personal feeling about waiting for Star to Fall. Um, Like, well, (laughs) we wrote the song and we sang it and um, performed it and and it's a hit. And so, yeah, there was that uh, very personal identification for both of us. And it was a long time dream. I mean, we'd been playing away at that for quite some time, many years. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was the fruition of a lot of hard work and um, hopes and dreams that actually happened, you know, and that's always a shock. You go, well, yeah, I've been aiming at this, but still there is no guarantee anything like that is ever going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the, the huge, uh, the huge um, fruition largely was the was the recording the the writing the performing and the recording Mm -hmm. that whole process and was i remember how hard we worked to get the the entire album out every every album is a birth of this you know trying to get all the disparate parts (laughs) together um you know and then of course there's the whole promotion side of it but i'm just talking about from the creative side to make sure that that what you aim to to say with that album initially is is presented mm-hmm. and all those little details the liner notes and everything to making sure sure of all of that and um you know and, you know and as you say that there's not any one of those disparate pieces to the song waiting for a star to fall that i felt went astray they all came together <laughs> Yeah, which is kind of rare. And you'll think, oh, I would do this differently. I wish we'd done that. But I don't think either of us feels that way about waiting for a star to fall. It just everything worked as it should, you know. Mm. No, it's perfect. Like it's it really is like it is a perfect song. (laughs) Listening to I know I didn't write it. You can just keep saying that all I wouldn't have wanted them to change anything. And I wouldn't have wanted Robert Palmer to do it. I wanted, you know, it was great. It was like the perfect thing for you two to. End well, he can, it. he could do it now. It'd be fun I mean, to hear him do it now. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a little tough, but. <laughs> well, <laughs> even, even we sing the song a little lower now. It's like you know, it's like it's down. Oh yeah, it's. Uh... Oh, we're getting a performance. I'm so excited. I hear your name whispered out. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't dare try to sing it in E flat anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you might lose your life. <laughs> yes. yes. And you guys had your daughter in the video with you, which was really cute. And it was just a fun, you know, it's it's it, thinking back to that time when you really are competing, when you want to do it right and you want to get a video out there, like mm-hmm. looking back at some of like, and I ribbed. Bill Champlin about this all the time. Looking back at some of the Chicago videos. Oh, you know I, go, what? I don't remember the what Chicago. What were you all videos? thinking? Why? Who chose that? <laughs> Why did you do that? I, I, I beat on Bill all the time about that. But 
but for you guys, <laughs> like when you go back and people watching this, I always encourage people go back and watch the music video to waiting for a star to fall because it's really, it's a fun loving, um, just carefree, innocent, sweet video that I think just stands the test of time. You can it never, it's not, there's never a time where it's dated. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Nice. We truly did have fun that we had fun with the making of it and the concept mm. with it. Um, <laughs> and I remember it was so fascinating to have it come out. And the, I don't even know if VH1 had been born yet. I think that it, we, it was just on MTV with- I think it was just MTV. So, yeah. so, so you had, you know, you had Twisted Sister and you had, Boy meets girl, and, <laughs> and so and and so you know I think the, the everybody was kind of going, uh, I don't want to see those little kids. But George, <laughs> you know you were on your way to having D Snyder's hair if you would have just given it a few more years. I was. You yeah. Yeah. Gotten I there, you know. I did. I had <laughs> there. Not the makeup, but <laughs> you know it was the crimping. I just wasn't into the crimping. <laughs> oh, well, we actually we we did a bit of the crimping I think back then too though. Come to I think did. Of it. No, and had a, crimping. You had your ponytail with your scrunchie and the and the crimping, right. Shannon. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, so there was a bit of I, my phone, uh, my phone alarm that I wake up to every single morning is the Bette Midler version, David Pack version of "I Know You by Heart." Oh. And I, I, I found out that like it's so funny. I would try different alarms, and I love that song. It's favorite from Beaches, but. Yeah. Um, uh their version you know I, I really do love their version uh, yeah it's a beautiful version they, david pack brings in such a great male vocal but i really would have loved to have heard the two of you do that well, song. and you just reminded me i mean david pack I, I don't think we've ever you know contacted him and thanked him for that i mean it's i would mm -hmm. you know i'd love to find him sometime and let I'll him know because it's a, it's a I'll fabulous oh it's a <laughs> you do that no, it's just <laughs> fabulous vocals you know those were that, that was such an honor at that point i, I think i think yeah. we just kind of felt like well we're the songwriters they're the stars or i don't know what it was but i don't either but i think it was a reef margin again our producer on waiting for star to fall who mm -hmm. got that song to bet because he maybe he produced that song but he had produced um bet midler and um uh, wind beneath my wings yeah, oh, maybe and, so. Um, yeah. I think he was at the connection point for getting that song to her. Did you two ever mm. record a version of that? We didn't. George we a... sing with Dolly Parton in the studio on it. I did. You I... should. I think you should. I'm just putting it out there. I think okay. I think that'd be really fun to, to hear that. <laughs> okay. You know, um, the 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 drummer on the demo, mm -hmm. I believe it was Charles Collins um and and charles has always loved that song and he's been after us to record our version so it's not out of the question charles is a smart man i like <laughs> charles yes charles is you would like man. charles you would have a good conversation with charles he, he a drummer for uh uh lou rawls uh you'll yes. never find you know. <laughs> and all those uh i i, I don't i don't belong down there um uh yeah um it's all the uh, like stylistics oj's cool Spinner, denise records. williams yeah denise yeah. williams yeah, yeah denise williams yep yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah how did you guys end up on backing vocals for let's hear it for the boy because i know you had you had written something for denise you'd worked with denise before we had uh we uh, we met denise um, a few years earlier, or I, I met her uh, by going back to Philadelphia with the producer of her rec a couple of records for her, uh, Tom Bell, and he was he was part of the the threesome, Mighty Three, uh, Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff, and Tom were the Mighty Three music. Very much of, part of the Philly sound. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and they were responsible for all those wonderful big hits, Archie Bell and the Drells and Stylistics OJ's spinners um um what's it what's his name close the door um <laughs> oh come on teddy pendergrass oh, oh sure yes. wow i i um yeah i met teddy pendergrass in the recording studio what a what an iconic you just felt his powerful energy when he came in it was great yeah. anyway uh, denise denise was uh, recording with tom 
And uh, he, Tom brought me back from Seattle. We were all living in Seattle. We went back to Philadelphia mm -hmm. uh, and he had me play synthesizer and sing backing vocals on her My Melody album. And what was the other album called? She had a second album that we did as well. And on there were a couple of real standout songs you should look up. One's called Silly. The title cut My Melody. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, and then also a version of Gonna Take a Miracle, which is a cover uh, and beautiful, beautiful version that Denise did. Anyway, Denise, uh, from that experience, um, hired uh, Shannon and I to be her backing uh, singers touring. And so we toured the world for a couple of years wow. with Denise. And uh, so we got to know each other. We were friends and that sort of thing. And and I think when it came time for her to do an album with George Duke back down in Los Angeles at that point, um, she called us up as her backing vocals, um, along with Jeffrey Osborne, I believe. Wasn't he part of that session too? Oh, or was it? Uh, oh, no, that was some, that was uh, haunting me. That was when, yeah, when oh, we recorded. Was it, um, Roosevelt yeah. Christmas, maybe. Was it three of us? I don't think he came in on the on the Denise sessions, but actually it was Jeffrey was on Haunting Me. Haunting uh, Me. Yeah. I think he did those. So yeah, we got to sing at that session. And those songwriters of Let's Hear It for the Boy on Dean yeah. Pitchford and Tom Snow were in Tom the Snow. Studio. Yeah. So we had a great time. So we met them and we yeah. met George Duke and we sang with Denise. And it was just really a fun session. Oh, and and George runs a really lively fun. I mean, his it was everybody was all relaxed and yeah. and uh and yeah. Tom Snow was in the booth, you know, helping uh kind of it, it was it's lovely that when a producer welcomes a writer in and asks them what they think and uh, any ideas you know because yeah. uh the, you know sometimes we have some ideas <laughs> about how things should go. you guys are filled with ideas are you kidding me <laughs> sure we have some ideas <laughs> talk about how did you guys create i want to dance with somebody oh we were called by Clive. He personally called, actually. And um, it's so nice to get a phone call from somebody saying, you know, rather than an email or, or whatever it was at the time, hearing through your publisher. But he personally called. George took the call. Hello, it's Clive Davis. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or Stanley Tucci. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, so he said, well, we're going to do a second Whitney Houston album. We'd like you guys to write a song for her and submit it. And um, I think we gave them Waiting for a Star to Fall first because we thought, oh, so yeah. serendipitous. We wrote it, you know, from an event at that first concert of hers. And, um, but Clive heard it and didn't think it was right. And so we sat down and wrote, I want to dance with somebody. And um, by that time we knew what Whitney's range was and, and her vibrancy and, who, and that she was going to reach the whole world. So, um, you know, I just, um, I always draw from something personal because otherwise it's really hard to just write a song. It might come out kind of flat. And um, so I was thinking of that I think it was it was sort of the twilight hour, the change of day uh, between day and, and evening. And I always get this kind of restless feeling like, well, what's going to happen about the rest of the day, you know, the evening? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I, I thought, well, for single people, that's a really big deal because they don't want to spend another evening alone. Um, they want to figure out something to do and feel connected. Yeah. So that's where that um, song came from, was imagining, you know, watching the clock, feeling like I, I need a plan. I just want to be with other people and I would love to meet somebody. So it was that kind of an idea and imagining a single person going out to a club or, or something and, mm. and with, with high hopes. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, you, know, you, you kicked it off with there's a boy, I know. With how uh, I know, I know oh, yeah. that's how I yeah, it's how I yeah. know. We kicked off that how I know with there's a boy. There's yeah. a boy I know. <laughs> yeah, he's the one I dream of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you wrote that. I, for, you wrote that before I want to dance with somebody. You wrote that before waiting for a star to fall. Yes. Yes. How will I know? Yeah. 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 So and kick off how will I know? 
How did you guys just start with that? Well, hmm. That song went through some changes. Um, we had, re I can't remember exactly how it went when it went out to Clive, who liked it and sent it to Narda. Narda took um, sort of some ideas from the music and lyrics mm -hmm. we sent him, and he wrote another portion of music, which um, he said, you know, can you, this feels like a verse. Can you guys write some lyrics for this part? So we wrote the lyrics kicked off with there's a boy I know. You know what, Meredith, you just you just kicked on a really cool topic because because the song, the demo of How Will I Know was defined in a whole different way. Shannon, Shannon's lyric, you know, intimated what she was about to write when we co-wrote with Narda and came up with the music structure for the verse. And then Shannon got a chance to define it, flesh it out a little bit more lyrically. Hmm. So, so I love how that question came up because all of a sudden it yeah. just it just makes me realize that Shannon's gift for for you know broadening the song that we already had. How how that verse ended up uh, coming to be, you know, with Narda's assistance as well. But but also did you have like, like a the way you defined it? Did you have a melody first like this? Did you, I mean, I'm just want to pick your brain for a second. Like as songwriters, does the melody come into your brain first or does that lyric come in first? And you go, I got the lyric, let's put the music or I've got the music, let's add the lyric. How did in, that? In our case, it's usually that the lyric comes first and mm -hmm. I usually right. come up yeah. with an in initial idea. Mm -hmm. um, the initial idea is often what ends up being the chorus. Um, so, and that was the case with How Will I Know? So I came up with that and then wrote some scribbly stuff. And well, then- how, uh, Just sticking with How Will I Know for a second. I love, I love another profile. I love, I love yeah. Well, cause, cause that, that, I mean, when Shannon had that lyric, um, let's see. So, so when, when we got a chance to work on that and I was looking at how will I know and I wanted to support it, that's mm -hmm. so you asked where the melody came from, right? Yeah. Well, it was like, like, you know, just supporting what Shannon had written there that with that, you know, and he just tracked your ear. Yeah. So, chorus. so, so it was just, you know, just working to support Music. what Shannon had come up with and, um, and and that melody actually ended up being kind of the 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 intimation in the in the in the verse as well. There's a boy, you know. Right. So it kind of looks into that. yeah. But you know, when Narda got the song, he um, he just identified that something was missing. Mm -hmm. And so when he called us up on the phone, he played his track over the phone. I don't even think we got a copy of it, but he played it over the phone. And um, and so we just wrote the lyric to it and he was right, you know? So it made it a much stronger song. Mm -hmm. It was a very kind of casual co-write <laughs> through, <laughs> through time and distance, um, which is much more common now, but, but less common at the time because yeah. it wasn't the internet or anything, you know, to write with. <laughs> right. Can't text lyrics. Well, and, and the song went, I think, to the perfect vo vocal, you know, vocalist because yeah. Sydney was a powerhouse. On, there's nobody like her. There's yeah. nobody. I don't think there are ever. I, I don't know if there ever will be again, but there's never been anybody like Whitney. No, totally. I mean, when, when we first heard her version of How Will I Know, it was like, you know, a tornado was blowing through the phone because it was that <laughs> powerful, you know, like compression. And <laughs> Is that how, that's how you heard it the first time was through we, the phone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was a. It was like, a. So they recorded it, and then they called you up, and they go because you know they don't they didn't have Skype or Zoom back then. Nothing. So, so they make a phone call, and they go here. Yeah. Put it up to the speaker. No, it was the. It was uh, <laughs> our our friends uh, Alan and Preston Glass um, that were working in the studio with Narda, called us uh, in the afternoon, uh, after they had just recorded Whitney. Okay, so this is so I mean the energy is still in the air. It's not a it's not a final mix. This is just like a rough. Hey, I got to play this for you. And so they they called us up that evening 
after the session and and said you got to hear this and and it's it was still still that's that's got to be one of the one of the great mm -hmm. memories of all time just that moment because there was just no way to define it. it i mean we knew the song a certain way but now it was like <laughs> <laughs> one one of the greatest voices that's ever graced the planet mm -hmm. just sang our song and killed it yeah killed it knocked it out of the park and 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 we're just hearing this little rough mix but I mean, you could just tell all right away that it's like, this is going to yeah. cause something. <laughs> I'm telling you, it really, I mean, I, I had the pleasure. I actually was on stage with Whitney ah. and I it was probably the, it's probably like the 87 or 88 tour. And, wow. I, and my, I, my dad's company did the sound for her. Oh, really? So we had dinner backstage her and her dad really nice guy yeah. he was yeah. lovely yeah. and then i'm on the side of the stage and she's at meriwether in maryland and she was singing the greatest love of all and oh. the children are our future and she pulled me on oh and come on are you serious <laughs> that's oh so cool <laughs> what, yeah, what um, did you do was, did you sing with her or gosh nobody wanted to hear a little mare sing um <laughs> they still don't want to hear mare sing um but I no I I just remember it was a very cool experience and back then you know yeah. my mom didn't have they didn't have cell phones I don't have any video or pictures that's something I would have oh, liked to have. but um yeah we, but I always have that memory it was cool oh uh, that's so cool what a nice connection <laughs> yeah we and your dad was a sound man yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 I love that. I love I love knowing that full circle for you too. I uh we met with Whitney once and it was in, in a backstage situation at, at the Greek theater and it was her mom yeah. and dad as well. Okay. So so but it was like she, it, probably around the same time that that you met her. Yeah. She was probably 19, would you say? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Around yeah. that I think around that. Yeah. 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 But same and, as you, we didn't get any photos and, you know, no, just, no oh, photos of it. No. A different world then. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? You wrote two yeah. of her biggest hits, the two of the biggest songs in the world. And you don't have oh, a picture with the her. TikTok, the, the TikTok in my head is um, Shannon and Whitney and I jumping up and down, just like going, yay. <laughs> and we're, and, we're, we're, we all just... <laughs> Like we were so know. excited and we were all kids really i mean it, it was just such a such a cool time you yeah. know uh and her, having her mom and dad there so the whole yeah. thing was just it was like this whole whole different uh thing that we had the opportunity to glimpse in on well we'll just have to stay yeah. sane so we can always have those memories since we don't have <laughs> Exactly. Oh, we we told or, you now so you can help us something. i'll help you remember in the yeah, future you can help or, us remember. Yeah, just call me and i'll remember i'll remind good. you good. good so uh we went into the pandemic and i and i hear that all of these artists just like you george right behind you you can see it have home studios and what are you going to do during the pandemic you come up with new stuff so talk about the album five did you did you create any of that during the pandemic or was that something that you guys had put together pre-pandemic and then you had to wait to push it out to people it was a combination of yeah. some songs that we'd had on the back burner mm -hmm. and hadn't gotten to and suddenly had a bunch of time like everybody did <laughs> you know <laughs> what am I going to do so we had those a uh, few songs on the back burner and then we started we wrote two of them brand new um uh let's see more deeply, more deeply in love with you yeah. was brand new yeah, um, we're deeply in love with and then part. everything new was pretty much new, it was new. yeah it was a little bit of a snippet that was old and then we finished writing it yeah. and then another song a constellation stars we finally figured out how to produce because it had been kind of stymieing us and stumping us about how to um, arrange it and how to sing it because it was feeling kind of plodding and so we we sort of got on to a more graceful way to record that song and it's such a visual yeah. sort of you know broad song we wanted to put it down get it recorded it, it takes five listens uh, i i love having at least at least a few songs that take five listens 
you know, I totally on any project. agree with you on that. I'm yeah. so on board with you on that because sometimes I'll listen to a song and right off the bat, I'm like, I don't like it, but then mm -hmm. I'll hear it again and then I'll hear it again. And then it becomes one of my favorite songs. Yeah. You yeah. do have to hear a song a few yeah. times. It's, that's sometimes the rare occasion happens where you listen to a song and you're like, Ooh, I like this. Mm -hmm. I like this a lot. I do like um, more deeply in love with you. I think it's a really cool. In fact, there's a local band here. Funny enough, my friends, they're called fives. The band is called oh. fives. <laughs> and George's voice reminds me of Mark's voice. And no. I'm going, God, this could be a fives song. Oh, and that's so funny. And it's five. And, and it's five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't there's know, some serendipity. Or something out in the future. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's very cool. And um, anything else on the horizon for Boy Meets Girl? Yeah, we... Um, yeah, always. Around, well, around about <laughs> January, we hope to be sitting in the studio um, doing some writing again on some new material. And then we thought, you know, there's a bunch of older songs. Well, not maybe a bunch, but I'm sure that we have five or maybe six um, songs that we recorded as demos and they never went anywhere. And so we might just make a demo compilation and sort of enhance the recordings a little and remix them. Yeah. So I just do, do that. that and that might be, you know, just for us and our family <laughs> or, or it may be good enough to put out, but um, we definitely want to do some more songwriting. We're, we're excited about it actually. Add one more. I want you guys to do I Know You by Heart. I think you guys would be amazing at that. That could go in with that compilation. Maybe that's the sixth song. Actually, yeah. actually, that yeah. one, a, a new version. Um, oh, you know what I could picture? We have, we also still have um, my uh, smooth R&B version of I Want to Dance with Somebody. Ooh. So, so we're, I want to, I still want to doll that one up for the future. Okay. That sounds cool. And I know <laughs> and, you got the martini the martini mix of how will I know that was cool right. yeah we, that was fun we recorded we that one time because George had a temporary but new to him studio set up um, when he moved to northern California and we needed to try it out yeah. and so we thought well let's just make a really fun silly version of how will I know yeah. so we so we did Were the martini drinking martinis we weren't but it had that kind of bubbly quality we do <laughs> drink martinis but <laughs> We weren't. We did. <laughs> I I think uh, uh, we we got inspired by uh, at the time that we did the the demo. There was a Japanese pop, like a real speed pop band called Pizzicato Five, and we just thought they were cool. They, they there there was a there was a way that they put their tracks together. I I was really keen on them, and I, uh, I know who you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Pizzicato Five. It's kind and, of very straight rhythms, you yeah, know, like yeah, up and it's, down, it's kind of, right. Yeah, uh -huh. and, and, and we thought, you know, How Will I Know has been known in a certain way and heard a certain way. And we're fond, we know, we know a song can be, you can, you can do anything to a song. And so mm -hmm. we just had this bug to see what would happen if we just kind of went in a completely different direction than anybody that ever heard the song and see if it could still work. And we we were also influenced by a band, uh, uh, Imogen Heap's band with uh, Guy Sigworth, uh, uh, it's called Fru Fru, back mm -hmm. in the early aughts. And uh, they had a song called Let Go and a few others. Really, you should go look them up, they're amazing. And yes. yeah, Fru Fru. And, uh, um, and so we were a little inspired by those things and and uh, and this kind of this kind of sort of an homage to the 60s a little um um uh, some of those group sings he really loves me you know in the background a little bit of muzak twist yeah right? a little muzak <laughs> and uh yeah so so we kind of we kind of just had fun with it just it really it really was like shannon presented it. it was like we were just testing out the studio uh, but she did this really cool breathy there's a boy i know you know the way she sang it and everything was yeah. so cool and um so it, it, it just poultry. yeah so so uh, uh, uh it just kind of sat there 
until now. And I'm really happy that, that we heard it again and saw its value because we, we put it in, into a, a mixer named Jay, Jay Broadway. He's from Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, awesome, awesome mixer. And he just, and he had some other things to, to, to offer, came up with some different uh, ways to pop Shannon's vocal into the beginning and the breakdown of it. And it became a, a really, I, I'm just really fond of it. It sounds, it just pops off my phone. I, I love it. I love what, he, but it's, it's a really different take. It won't be for everybody. Some people will hate it, <laughs> <laughs> but we like it. We love it. <laughs> oh, well, I love you guys. And I thank you for taking some time to talk to me today. And I, I admire how you guys are working together and you guys are so like complimentary towards each other. It's so nice to see that, you know? Uh, thank you. That's, thank you. that's a lovely thing to say. And um, what a fun interview, really. Yeah, thank you, Meredith. Such a I fun like interview. Don't yeah. go anywhere. I'm gonna sign off, but don't go anywhere. Okay. Okay.